Hello, everybody, and welcome to our CMI webinar series designed for and by CMI. I'm Cynthia Howell, and I'm going to be your. I uh, work in the education training and outreach arena for CMI. And I want to tell you a little bit about the webinars. Uh, to, uh, many of you have been on them, many of them before, but just in case, we have some new folks here. These are hosted by Colorado School of Mines. And if you have a suggestion for a future webinar, we are always looking for more um, opportunities. Please let us know. Uh, this is a public webinar and it's going to be available next week at aimslab.gov slash CMI. Uh, do look under the uh, workforce menu and also on YouTube on the Critical Materials channel questions we're going to save them to the end and they can be typed into the q a box at any time um, and we're looking forward to that moment but also i'd like to right now introduce our presenters from alanonia um, we have dr kent Sorensen. he's the chief technology officer and he's taken uh, his expertise to over 200 sites worldwide He's co-authored over 40 publications, and he has a PhD in civil and environmental engineering from the University of Idaho. He's going to be presenting with a colleague today, and his colleague is uh, Dr. Dial Saran. Uh, Dial is the Vice President of Research at Alanonia, and he is a global, um, he's done a lot of work across uh, with 15 years of industry experience, and he has um, also uh, leveraged his metabolic engineering and biochemistry, as you will find out as they share with us. He has his PhD in biochemistry from Indiana University, Bloomington. And I really don't want to take any more time of our presenters time. What I'd like to do is have them take over um, right now. So, all right. all right. Thank you, Cynthia. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, everyone. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to share some of the work we're doing with rare earth elements uh, through CMI. So this is uh, an exciting chance for us to get to talk to you about some of these things. Um, as we get going, I'm going to start out by sharing uh, a little bit about Alonia. Um, we're a fairly new company, so a lot of you may not know much about what we're doing. So I'll talk to you a bit about that and, and some of the types of things that we're working on. And then as we dive into the REE work, I'll hand it off to Dial and, and he'll take it from there and talk about some of the general work and then uh, specific project that we're working on. So to start out with, Alonia is really founded on, on the premise that waste is a failure of imagination. And we really are inspired by looking at nature and seeing that nature does everything in cycles. So we have a carbon cycle, a nitrogen cycle, a hydrologic cycle, everything is, is circular in nature's economy. But what we see since the industrial revolution is, is a lot of very linear systems where there's a starting point and an end point that don't connect. We don't have that circularity. And so what we wanna do is, is take that inspiration from nature and work toward a world where we get much closer to that, that circularity in, in everything that we're doing. And, and instead of having waste, um, have resources that can be leveraged for some type of value. The way that we go about that is again, to work in harmony with nature, to fast forward what nature would probably do anyway. So if you look at a lot of the problems and challenges that we're working on, it's not that nature can't figure out how to solve these problems. It, it very often can, but in a lot of cases that might be centuries or even millennia that, that it would require. So we wanna look at what's the best starting point that we can identify in a natural system and then leverage that to accelerate what nature might do anyway and, and get to an end point where we can you know, create that circularity. And we do that by leveraging the power of biotechnology with engineered systems to attempt to develop transformative solutions working toward that waste and pollution-free world. The 
particular industries that we're focused on at Alonia are, are shown here. Um, so it's mining, energy, industry, and by industry here, what we really mean is emerging contaminants, water and wastewater treatment, those types of things, um, and plastics. So the projects that you see associated with each, with each of these market sectors are, are projects we are actively working on. So within metals and mining, we have things like uh, beneficiation to remove impurities from ore. We are working with mine tailings, both from a value recovery standpoint, as well as a carbon sequestration approach. Um, and then of course, the topic for today, you know, energy critical elements or, or rare earth elements. So these are all active things that we're working on. In the energy sector, um, we're focused right now on helping deal with the challenge that producers uh, uh, in the oil sands have with process water from, from oil sands development. And specifically that's dealing with naphthenic acids that are present in that process water that needs to be detoxified uh, prior to release of that water, allowing closure of some of those operations. On the emerging contaminant side, we're very focused on PFAS and 1,4-dioxane. Um, and we have uh, treatment technologies associated with both of those. Um, and then also on the sensing side, particularly for PFAS, we're working on a biosensor that we've made some exciting progress on um, just in the last few months. And then finally in plastics, plastics is an area where we're really focused on the idea, not just of degradation or, or biodegradation, but of upcycling. How can we break complex polymers down into building blocks that can then be reused to make virgin materials? The way that we go at this is really captured in this slide. And the way that I think about these components, bioinformatics, transformative biology, and integrated systems is in terms of discovery, design, and deployment. So for environmental bioinformatics, that's the discovery piece. That's where we look in the natural system into that biological community, into the, the microbiome and, and say, who's there? What are they doing? What genetic capability is present that might present a starting point for us to move into the design phase with the transformative biology. And that's where we're doing you know, microbial engineering um, or other types of deployment engineering to develop solutions that can be safely deployed in the field. And that takes us into the deployment, the integrated systems, where we add in the, the engineering component to turn it from uh, a good biological solution in a laboratory to an actually you know, field deployable solution at scale that provides value. So that, that's the three pieces that we're really focused on. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dial to talk about what we're doing specifically um, on some of these projects and then and then REEs. Oh, uh, thank you, Kent. Um, so as 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 Kent said, like uh, this is this is uh, he he talked about the high level process uh, of of how how we we look at the project, we look at the integrated systems, uh, we look at the bioinformatic piece, then we look at the transformative biology piece and then uh, and then the integrated system. So this is a little bit more information on what goes on uh, in that area. So uh, in the bioinformatic piece, or we can call it a uh, earlier than that, a proof of concept is we always look at the solution in the nature. We know that nature can do most of these things. It's just that nature is really slow. So we need to expedite that. But to find a biology that we are looking for, we always go at the site. So for example, if we are looking for degrading certain chemicals, then we look for the organisms that are growing in there and see if we can find an organism that can degrade it so that we can make it faster. Or if we are looking for, uh, let's say metal, uh, we have a bunch of projects in metals, uh, then we look for, uh, we go to that size, identify proteins that are found in various microorganisms that are capable of binding to that metal at a very high affinity uh, uh, so that we can develop that into a product. So most of the project, the starting point is we go to the site and then we isolate the bacteria. For, for If we're looking for the whole cell solution, then we isolate the bacteria and fungi, uh, other microbes, 
and then we test those microbes for their ability to perform the function that that we are interested in. Um, and at the same time, we also, uh, to identify what these microbes are, we also do the genetic sequencing and identification to, to do the taxonomic analysis to find out what are those microbes. Of course, we don't want to work with pathogens or, or, or BL3 type of uh, organisms. So uh, we go through this whole process. Uh, in case of uh, proteins or enzymes, uh, we do extract all the, micro all the DNA that we can, uh, from the uh, from the contaminated site or from the uh, interesting site where where we, we think the biology exists, let's say for example metals, we 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 go to the site where uh, which are rich in that particular specific metal. We extract the DNA and then we do the whole genome sequencing and identify um, a list of proteins that we think theoretically at least have a possibility to bind to these metals. And it's it's now that biotechnology and bioinformatics has gotten to a point where people can look at the sequence, look at the structure, and can do some level of prediction uh, that yes, these metals have a potentially, potentially ability to bind to metals at least. And from there on, uh, once then you create a library, you know, depends on your throughput, it can be library up to 100 to 10,000 different protein enzymes. Uh, then to test that library, you put that in a, some sort of host, a biological host. Uh, we generally for proteins, we prefer to use bacteria, E. coli or yeast, Topikia, uh, these microbes because they are already known to produce their proteins, heterologous proteins very well. So we then build a library, DNA synthesis, that requires a lot of DNA synthesis that require the recoding um, uh, of, of the DNA. We also need to look at the, the drivers that drives the protein synthesis, include promoters and terminators and ribosome binding sites. So there is, there is a huge set of things that we need to do to then create a library that then can then be tested. So you'd create a library, transform that into a host that can produce these proteins and once this, and then you start testing it in a high throughput format. So again, as I said, like let's say if you're doing the 5,000 uh, microbes, the uh, proteins, and if you're doing N is equal to two or three, then suddenly your library is huge and you need the robotics. So that's where we use the, we have with Ginkgo Bioworks, we use the robotics to test uh, thousands and thousands of different proteins. And once then you go through this whole screening process and then find the protein that you are interested in, then you need to figure out how to deploy that protein on an organism in, in other cases, uh, so that you can, they can you can purify the metal of interest. I'm I'm, I'm talking about metal because this, this is this is uh, this this presentation is focusing on metal though. But then, so you need once you have a protein, you need to figure out what's the best way to deploy that. Uh, whether you want to express this protein in the cell and use the microbe as a bag of protein, so that you can purify it later. Or in some cases, we are looking into putting these micro uh, in, in these proteins in a, in a some sort of encapsulation technology where you you put encapsulate them so that they are they are protected against the uh, outside environment, uh, but then they still can do the function that we are looking for. And once you figure out the deployment, then you do the scale up, and and then you have to do optimization in the scale up, um, and whatever learning you have, you can go back and other fix it again, but that's a generic process of how uh, mostly Alonia work. Um, now, uh, I'll, I'll give you a little bit more details on, on, on this, especially for the work that we are doing uh, on REE, Rare Earth Metal. Uh, but before that, I want to give you an example of the work that Alonia and, and Ginkgo has done in the past on REE, where um, Again, the goal is to find uh, uh, proteins that can be used to extract rare earth metals from a different source. In this case, we were looking for uh, post-consumer electronic waste. Um, so um, there, and there is a literature precedent of these proteins exist. One of them, which is I'm sure most of you already know, called lanmodulin, uh, that is a protein that, that has a very good affinity for uh, lanthanides. Um, so what we did is uh, we used uh, lanthanide as a, as a seed and look for the various different, uh, we build a library 
uh, of proteins uh, that have a similar sequence as well as a structural hom homology. Structural homology is a little complicated. Uh, sequence homology, of course, you can pull it out in many different ways. But to, uh, because uh, the good part about structural homology is that if you have a good algorithm, then it doesn't have to have a similar sequence and then you can still be able to pull it out uh, uh, certain uh, better proteins. So using that technology, we were able to build a library of around 1400 different uh, proteins. And then we started testing it um, again uh, because of the replicates uh, and, and, and promoters and terminators. We had almost uh, around like 10,000 samples. And uh, then we tested them for, and I'll show you in the next slide how, how exactly we tested those. But then we were able to pull out proteins that had 5x better affinity than the best in class, which is known in the literature called len modulin. So we just by doing a one round, uh, no engineering, it's, these are all natural proteins um, that were pulled out from various different databases. And we were able to find something which is 5x better in binding affinity uh, than len modulin, which, is, which, is, which was pretty exciting. And that, that kind of tells you that there are protein out there in the nature that, that can actually be used to uh, uh, concentrate lanthanides, as well as, uh, of course, uh, we haven't done the protein engineering and we can always make it more specific. Uh, just to give you a little bit more on len modulin and, and what metal binding proteins are, uh, metal binding is a very common protein in the uh, in, in in the nature. Almost one third of the protein binds to metal in some way or form. Uh, again, we 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 focused on len modulin, which is found in the bacteria that grow uh, in a uh, it was growing in the lanthanide rich region of the soil, and which which is what we told you in the in the past also that uh, in the previous slide that we always try to go and try to find the biology near the source because nature has already started to developing some of the biology that we are interested in. Uh, it's, it's easier to improve the biology than discover a new biology. So we always think that we can improve it if what nature has to find it. Um, uh, but, but, but nature uh, always uh, gives us the starting point. Um, so using this protein as a base, uh, we, we, we developed the, so this, this, this protein, uh, it's 11 kilogram Darton and it has a three binding site. So this is also something we were interested in, the cooperativity in the protein where, where you have more and more binding site and it, it becomes more and more stable. So using that, we were able to build, we built the library and uh, uh, we have the uh, proprietary uh, source uh, um, um, algorithms which can, again, as I said, look into not just the sequence homology, but also at the structural homology and, and can really look in the many different um, kingdom, whether it is, again, look for bacteria, fungi, plant, and everywhere else. And we were able to uh, build around uh, 1,800 different variants. Um, and then we, uh, once, uh, and then we tested it. And so the next slide, I'm gonna talk about how exactly to test the binding of these proteins uh, for the length, or lanthanide binding uh, of these proteins. So there is a, something called uh, Delphi assay. And how it works is that you, you express the protein, uh, whichever host you want it to express it in. But once you have a protein in, in the tube, you add the metal solution, right? Um, uh, you add lanthanides in this case we were using Dysprosium as a as a as a as a, as a, uh, as a surrogate for our lanthanides, and then once once you once the protein binds to the uh, dysprosium, then you wash out all the extra free dysprosium uh, from the thing. So now you only have a dysprosium which is bound to the protein. Then you add something called this uh, Delphia assay or Delphia reagent, and what it does is that it denatures the protein, it denatures the proteins and free up the metal. And that metal, then it, it creates a, some sort of mycel um, around the metal. So now you have this uh, uh, metal, and then there, there, there is this uh, reagent around the metal. And that reagent itself, you can shine the light and then monitor the, the, uh, the, the luminescence that, that the reagent creates. And depend on what metal 
this reagent is bound to, um, it gives a different uh, emission spectrum. So as, as you see in the, in the bottom of the graph, depends on the metal, you see a different wavelength. And uh, uh, so based on the emission, you can actually say that this, this particular protein is binding to uh, iridium or, or, uh, or terbium or, 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 or dysprosium or, or whatnot on neodymium, so that, uh, uh, it'll, it'll actually tell you. Uh, and that way you can actually isolate the, uh, not just the specificity for the lanthanides over copper and cobalt and iron, but also within the lanthanides, you can separate heavy versus light, or, or we can even engineer the proteins to separate heavy versus light, or even at an individual level. Um, so that's the assay we uh, are, uh, using. And uh, this is, again, uh, even more details on how exactly the whole process work in terms of in the foundry, how the robots work. So let's say you have, a, um, uh, as I was telling you earlier in the previous slide, that uh, you use the sequence similarity and, uh, uh, and the structural similarity uh, of the known biology, a known protein, and then we build around uh, 1500 construct. You transform that in e, e. coli or, or picia or yeast, whatever your favorite host that can produce the protein. And choice of host is also depends on uh, whether you want to produce these uh, inside the cell or you want to secrete them outside. The secret, secreted ones are more pure, uh, but the ones that are uh, internal to the cell, you can at least produce a uh, more quantity. So well, in this case, we were using it internally because we really didn't need to secrete it and have a very high quality protein for, for the testing purposes. Um, so we transform that in E. coli. And then um, we, we have uh, 1500 becomes 3000 because we wanted to use two biological replicates. So it becomes uh, uh, 3,000 cultures, which means 30 plates, and in 30 plates, you need robots because manually you cannot do any of those things. Um, and then we grow the culture, uh, we grow the cells. Uh, once the cells were uh, grown, you spin them down, uh, spin them down. Now the cells are on the bottom of the plate, and, and then you start to resuspend them and lyse them. So now you're breaking the cells. So each well in the plate has a unique protein in it. Um, um, and it's like um, two wells. Uh, and then, um, um, and then once once you do that, then there is a uh, you just trying to get rid of all the other thing. Uh, there's a purification step, and then you start testing it. Now, now testing it, you need to transfer all this liquid into a, a, a different kind of plates. Um, N is equal to three. This is, this is a technical replicate, so it becomes ten thousand ish. Um, and you started to now test for uh, for for binding, and that's where you use the the Delphi assay. And once you find which one gives you the, the, the best affinity, um, we then basically, you, you be selected the top 20 protein, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you a little bit later. Uh, 20 proteins, we were able to isolate that where the binding affinity was uh, 5x that I told you earlier, 5x better than, than what is um, best known protein, which, uh, which, which is a uh, um, len modulin. And then, then we started to scale up and do more characterization. And, and, and this characterization is uh, uh, the pH stability and, and, and temperature stability, reversibility, cooperativity, and, and, and touch upon that in the next, next slide or so. But idea is that we were able to perform this and able to, so we screened around 10,000 reaction and we were able to find something which is, which is uh, 5x better uh, in terms of binding, uh, dysprosium and terbium, and, but the sequence while it was completely different, very different, only 35% identity, identical sequence. Uh, although, although when we looked at the structure of the binding site, uh, the binding site secondary structure was similar to the lanthanides, the, the one that we have, uh, len modulin, uh, but the sequence, overall sequence was very different. Um, so that was a that was a uh, that was very exciting, and that's where we we proposed uh, wrote a CERDA proposal, um, uh, and and we won that proposal where we say that okay we have now um, 
uh, 16 to 20 proteins and we want to analyze it for, for various uh, different functionality. But before I go there, I want to uh, talk about the deployment because now you have a protein. Uh, you can imagine um, if you want to recycle the post uh, consumer electronic waste or you know, do re recycle wherever, from wherever, whatever, whatever source it is. You take the magnets, you take the metal, you have to do some sort of pretreatment, dissolve it in acid most likely, uh, which, which lowers the pH. That's why I was saying we need the low, low pH uh, functional proteins. Now you have a solution, solution which has your lanthanides and then, but it has a bunch of other metals, right? So now you cannot just add protein because really it you can add protein, but then how will you separate out the protein from, from rest of the solution? <clears throat> so what we are doing, we're developing a, uh, this uh, uh, surface display technology. And the idea is uh, that uh, you, you build this micro, uh, that is pH stable, uh, that can, uh, once you put the protein inside the cell, it'll display that target protein that we know binds to the uh, specific metal on the surface of it. And, and once you, so you can imagine you grow this, we grow the culture uh, of the microbe, which is displaying the desired protein on the surface of it. And then you add these microbes in the in the in the solution that you created, um, uh, dissolved uh, metals, and then it's easier to separate the microbes because then you can let the microbes settle down on the bottom. Uh, you can filter it out if if there is too much um, garbage or, or too much uh, solids in the original um, uh, the pretreated uh, metals. You can first filter them out so that you get rid of all the um, solids, and then you add your cells. Cells will sit on the bottom. You can take the cells out, um, and then uh, uh, and then you can uh, denature the proteins on the surface of the cell, and that will release the metals. And actually, uh, we are working with the one 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 company, and they have actually done a pretty good job on it. They were successful. You were able to express around. They, 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 the claim is there, and, and we, we're working with that. We haven't confirmed it. Around 100,000 copies of the protein on the surface of the cell. Um, and it is uh, one picture where they, they showed uh, one of the metals. Um, but, uh, but you can imagine how, how, how this, this can then be used. So um, this is just showing the, how we imagine. It's a, it's a conceptual idea. Uh, we haven't proven it or tested it. Um, but the conceptual idea is that once you find the protein that binds very specifically to a target metal uh, in a solution. So you add that uh, dissolved metal solution in a reactor, you add your microbes that are grown somewhere else, um, and then you put it in the reactor and you let the metal bind to the cells, then you let the cells settle on the bottom. Uh, and then you separate the cells out. At this point, while we are doing this, we don't want, we don't think the cell needs to be metabolically active. So that's why we grow the cell somewhere else and then we just dump it here. Again, it will be very low pH, uh, but we want to make cells pH stable. Uh, but at the same time, although we don't want cells to be metabolically active, we don't want, we want, we do want to reuse these cells. So we are, we are also looking into, um, how much change in the temperature we will have to do. So the surface proteins starts to get melt, melted uh, or, or uh, uh, and, and they release the metal and then they can refold. So we just want to use the folding, refolding because the more times we can use these cells, the, the better the economics becomes. Um, so so this, is, this, is, this is the hypothetical idea we have we have a bunch of other idea but we we prefer this one because uh there there is some data we already have that shows that this 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 can work or looks good and the second thing is that uh, uh this this we think is the, the the cheapest option of the all possible scenarios that we are considering told you one before which was uh encapsulating it in a ceramic beads or in the plastic beads um, although they are more robust, uh, we want to see the the, the, the cost side of it. Um, so here's the uh, just to just quickly walk you through the in the startup work. 
that that we proposed um what we are hoping to achieve um uh, with this work is so we already told i already told you that we identify 16 to 20 enzymes that are better than the best in class len modulin right now we're trying to see if any of these enzymes have a bit <coughs> excuse me uh higher affinity for uh uh, for length and heights over any other metal lines because, and we already know even len, len modulin has a pretty specific binding uh, for uh, length and height versus other metals. So we think uh, that 100x is definitely achievable. Um, and then we are also looking for HRE versus LRE because in certain application, HREs are heavy rare are, are mostly used and in some other cases, the 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 light rare earth. So we're trying to see if we can separate the HRE versus LRE. Ultimate goal is to separate individual uh, metals, but at this point for the startup proposal, we are we're doing the HRE and LRE. And that's what was uh, asked in the proposal. We also want to make sure that these proteins can work under the low pH because in most cases we think we will have to solubilize these metals uh, using some sort of inorganic acid, whether it is hydrochloric acid or nitric acid. So uh, these 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 uh, proteins need to work under under the low pH environment. Melting, as I said earlier, that uh, for the best economics, uh, if 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 we want to make it really cheap, then the more time we can do the reversibility of these uh, folding and folding, the the better uh, economics is going to be. So we're looking for temperature stability. Um, and then see if we can melt it and then let it refold. Cooperativity is something we are very interested in. It's not mentioned here, uh, but we are looking for um, Len modulin has like a three binding site, and uh, we have a protein that has like four of our target is like five to six binding site. With the idea that cooperativity, the way it works, that every time a metal binds, uh, it, it folds the protein so that the second binding becomes even easier or faster, the affinity increases. And then the, as, as the number of metal binds, the affinity becomes better and better. So you can see that it's like a cascading. Once once is once is bound, then it just, it just binds to all six of them. Uh, these are the target proteins, uh, target metals we are uh, interested in for, uh, uh, for the startup proposal. Um, most of them are like neodymium is very common in the magnets. Uh, dysprosium is used in the in the uh, a lot in by the army, and then there are other other um, uh, metals also are, are of interest to in, in various industries. Uh, benefits, um, it's it's yeah, it's I mean you the, the whole reason of why we are developing a biological process is because. The current process, the chemical process, is is very energy intensive, and it uses a lot of the toxic solvents. And uh, it's a huge volume of these uh, toxic solvent that is being used. Hundreds of cycles of uh, ion exchange runs that people do to separate these, and it's uh, expensive and it's uh, again not very good for the environment. So if we use the biological process. Even if the biological process doesn't give you the final 99.99%, but even if it can see you closer uh, to the final solution so that you only have to now run 10 round of ion exchange instead of 100 round of ion exchange, it, 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 it will help um, uh, from the environmental point of view. Uh, so I think uh, that's that's the, uh, and, and plus we want to develop a process that, that we can do it uh, in the United States. So. Um, so I think these are the definitely if you use the bio biotechnology, I think it will be it will be uh, very helpful for 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 many reasons. Uh, so next step is uh, we are um, as, uh, once once we identify the protein out of those sixteen uh, with certain characteristics, we're gonna then start engineering it for 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 uh, specific um, uh, micro uh, metal. We're gonna engineer it for cooperativity. Uh, and and we look at what is what else is needed, and we'll we'll we have a, a different um, directions in which we can go in terms of engineering solution deployment solution. As I said, for the protein, we use the we are currently testing the protein based solution. We are currently testing the um, um, basically the the uh, surface display. 
technology, but then we are also thinking about looking at the economics of the ceramic beads and various kinds of beads. Uh, there's a, a technology called Vault, um, one, of our, one of our partners uh, uh, at UCLA uh, developed that. And these are all very good technology, very stabilize these proteins and then make the separation very easy. Um, and then the wholesale based, uh, one of the whole, I mean, the, the surface display you can think of are at the wholesale based also, but it's displaying the protein on the surface. But you can also imagine expressing the cell inside the cell and the, it's the metal accumulates inside the cell. Um, although we think the economics is not going to be as well. And then the ultimately process optimization, how to make this whole process of uh, uh, scale up the cells and, and then um, where is the, uh, how, how cheap is the uh, pretreatment, melting, and this, this, the whole process, whole, like, there are multiple steps into the funnel. So we need to optimize those. Um, so that's where we are. Um, and we would um, thank you everyone for listening and, and I'm open for questions. Uh, Kent and Dial, I want to thank you very much for a great presentation on uh, Alonia and allowing us to see the use of biotechnology and engineering uh, to solve extraction waste challenges that you are working on right now. And uh, there are lots of questions queued up. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, thanks, Cynthia. Um, the first question I see in the queue is, uh, from Bob Sinclair, what resources are under development for understanding the microbiome associated with mining sites? Thanks for that question, Bob. Um, so we are doing a couple of different things in, in this regard. So one of the things that um, Dial already mentioned is that our, our partner Ginkgo Bioworks has you know, a significant code base of annotated proteins and enzymes. Um, that is, is one resource that's certainly available to us. Specific to mining and metals, we decided uh, about a year ago to join a project called the Mining Microbiome Analytical Platform in Canada. So it's funded in large part by the Canadian government, as well as uh, a couple of major mining companies, University of British Columbia, and a couple of other um, industry partners to build really an unprecedented database from the mineral extraction industry, collecting about 15,000 samples in the next year and a half from mining sites, mostly throughout North America, to sequence everything that, that, that we can find in those samples, essentially. So that large you know, genomic database is, is one of our, our major resources that's under development. And then in addition to that, as we continue to do projects with uh, mining companies or other metals related projects, and we collect samples from various sites, uh, we, we also have our own uh, bioinformatics platform where we keep all of the data associated with those samples. So that's not only the sequence data and all of the genomic data, but also the metadata associated with those samples. You know, what, what was the pH from that site? What's the geochemistry? What's the temperature? Th those types of things. So those are those are some of the resources that we are using for that discovery part of our process that I talked about earlier in the slides. So uh, for the second question, Dial, I'll, I'll let you take the lead on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know why the slide will change. Um, so yeah, so um, Rachel Chaudhary, uh, this question is, any comments on whether the best protein variants work land land m structural or sequence homologies so let me go back to this slide uh, um, so the in the bottom it says that um, we only saw 35 percent identity to the previous best in class which is the land m so the the sequence was uh, very different now then when we looked at the the binding site again the sequence of the binding site was different, but we did see the structural similarities uh, on the cavity where the metal is binding. Um, so I'll take the next cut. I'm hoping that's it. That's what you're looking for. Yeah, and so the I'll, next 
Yeah, I'll take the next one from okay. Yoshiko. Um, okay. So this question is, can you provide us with examples of the work you have done with the mining industry in beneficiation as well as carbon sequestration? So I can do that at a high level. Um, so both of those projects are, um, you know, uh, under NDA, so I can't get into specifics, but at, at a high level, what I can say is that on the beneficiation side, uh, we have a, a major mining company partner that's interested in removing some of the impurities from their ore, really for two purposes. One is doing so greatly reduces the carbon footprint of the processing of that ore. Um, so that's one benefit. And then the second benefit is you're also increasing the percentage of the target metal in that ore. And so the ore is also more valuable. So it's kind of a double benefit in beneficiation, which, which makes it pretty attractive. And uh, we've been through two phases of, of work with them on that project. And we're seeing, um, honestly, better uh, impurity removal than we expected. And so we're looking at the third stage currently. On carbon sequestration, what I can say is, again, we have a, a partner that's a, a different major mining company that was interested in how do we take mine tailings and turn them into a resource. And so we're looking at the process I, I like to call biomineralization. So basically sequestering CO2 as, as carbonate minerals um, in mining assets such as tailings, waste rock, et cetera. Um, and so we're in the first year of that project with that mining company. Yeah, and, and I think I can just uh, add something at a slightly higher level also. Um, uh, so just, just to get you where we are uh, with this company, uh, we, we had three impurities that we were trying to remove and the target for those will be around like 40% removal. They say that if we do 40% removal, that will be economical and actually very good for us. And, and, and we were able to hit 50 to 60% removal of those impurities. Uh, using the biological process. So I think um, that, that was a very exciting uh, result for us. And Dial, I think you can take the next one. Yeah. Um, uh, Ratul, uh, could you comment on the 5X protein uh, structure, overall structure homology to LANM? So yeah, I think the similar uh, question that I answered that uh, it, it overall protein structure is different. Overall sequence is only 35 but there is a similarity in the in the binding site itself. Um, but but again, we still we uh, this protein binds much better. And then Dial, I think you can take this next. Uh, one what is the company that Alonia is working with for denaturing the proteins? Uh, uh, we 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 haven't. Uh, uh, started to work with this. This, as I said, this was a conceptual idea. Um, we know that we can use temperature to denature it. We haven't, uh, we haven't gone there because the set of project hasn't been started. What, where we are right now is the, uh, is the proteins that we have identified. Uh, right now we are only looking at in, in the laboratory conditions. You can see that we can increase the temperature of the solution and see at what temperature we start to see the, uh, the release of metals. But that, that's where we are right now. Yeah, and the next question is how selective is this separation against background elements in the solution? For example, thorium, uranium, and other trivalents. And um, you know, honestly, the one that we looked at right now is iron. So that's that's been the focus. And Dial presented some of the data uh, for iron. But Dial, what, what else do you want to add? No, yeah, I think we have tested iron, calcium, cobalt, like the, the common ones, uh, but uh, thorium, uranium, yeah, this, these, this, everybody says that, and it's, it's, we know it is something we need to test. We haven't tested that yet. But these are the, these are the things that are all part of the next step. We have a little bit more time for additional questions. So while we're waiting to see if anybody has another question, um, uh, Kent and Dial, do you have any uh, final comments or anything that struck you in the questions that you'd like to further address? I, 
I think, you know, just at a high level, um, and, and Dial touched on this in one of the slides, as, as we've, you know, launched our journey here with Alonia, one, one of the areas that's really been exciting for all of us is, is metals and mining. And we just think there's a, a huge untapped potential in that area for biotechnology or transformational biology, because it really hasn't been explored, you know, that much, that deeply, certainly not synthetic biology. Um, and, and biology is very good for reasons of survival at identifying and sequestering specific metals. So I just think there's a, there's a lot of potential there. And, um, you know, this is something we're, we're excited to continue to explore. Um, and, and REEs, I think, is, is one great opportunity to do that. And, and uh, yes, and, and the other thing is that what, what, what Ken pointed out that the technology that we are working right now, um, you can imagine that this can be applied to various different metals. And like lithium is also coming up uh, soon where, where, where you need to um, improve the lithium sequestration, lithium, lithium separation. Um, and uh, we are already talking to um, other mining companies for metals other than rare earth and uh, with this technology uh, using the similar technology. So, um, and, and actually rare earth also. Um, and uh, uh, so I think the technology that we are developing is, 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 is uh, we're hoping that it's gonna be uh, useful for various different metals. And one of the other targets that may seem obvious uh, for, for doing this is acid rock drainage. So in, in those types of systems, yeah. in a lot of cases, there's a lot of valuable metal that's just being discharged um, and ending up in the environment. And we think there's huge potential to recover that uh, in a way that not only creates value, but also decreases impact on you know, the ecological environment. Thank you for those additional there... comments. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was saying that, the, and the, the good part about that is uh, the, the the current uh, metals uh, solubilize. You have to solubilize it in the low pH. Acid acid rock drainage is already a low pH, so we don't even have to uh, engineer for the acid mine drainage. Uh, uh, mine impacted water uh, that that Kent is pointing out. The same proteins that are uh, that we are working for for this project can directly be applied there because um, we already engineer these proteins for uh, to work in under the low pH environment. Thank you, and it does look like you have one last question from Stephen. Yeah, I see that. So the question is: Have you applied for patents on this process, and do you intend to license the IP? And we have a couple of different um, business models that we work with, one of which would be yes, to, to license the IP. I will say it's, it's a bit case specific, particularly um, in some of the uh, mining solutions uh, or mine related solutions, depending upon obviously specific agreements that we have with our um, technology development partners in those. But, at a high level, I would say the answer to your question is, is yes, we are generating IP and yes, we have a model for licensing IP. With that, um, and again, great questions. Uh, doesn't look like there are any other in the queue, but I wanna thank you again, uh, Dial and, and uh, Kent for a great presentation. I'm sure you've stirred a lot of interest in, in your company. So thank you for presenting with us today. And also thank you to everybody that attended. This recording is gonna be available next week at aimslab.gov CMI on YouTube and the Critical Materials Institute channel. Um, also information about the next webinar will be found in the critical times like usual and also um, on our website. If you have a suggestion for a future webinar topic or presenter, please share it on the exit survey. Again, this is designed for you and by you. So we certainly wanna to continue to hear from you regarding what is of a value for you at your workplace. Thank you again to the presenters, uh, Kent and Dial, it, excellent. 
And uh, we'll look forward to seeing everybody next month.